Welcome, everybody, uh, to folks filing in. Uh, my name is Gabe Scheinman. I'm the executive director of the Alexander Hamilton Society. Uh, it's great to have so many folks with us here today. Uh, for those who uh, may be joining us for the first time, uh, just a, a little bit about us. The Alexander Hamilton Society is a nonpartisan, not-for-profit national organization that seeks to identify, educate, and launch young men and women into the foreign policy national security world, imbued with the Hamiltonian perspective of strong and principled American leadership in global affairs. We operate first and foremost on, on, on our college campuses across the country, uh, where our student-led chapters host some of our nation's most eminent scholars and practitioners on U.S. foreign policy for debates with some of their own faculty. Uh, our over 50 chapters host nearly 200 events a year on campus, and our nearly 1,000 alumni uh, are serving across the national security and foreign policy space uh, in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere. Uh, if you're interested in learning more, you can always go to our website, alexanderhamiltonsociety.org, and, and love to connect with you. Um, today, uh, I'm really uh, excited to, to have a, a friend and somebody I learned from a lot uh, join us to talk about his new book. Uh, uh, so uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Ian Easton. Uh, Ian is the Senior Director at the Project 2049 Institute, which uh, might be something you can tell us a little bit more about, um, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, author, or previous author, not today's book, of The Chinese Invasion Threat, Taiwan's Defense and American Strategy in Asia. He previously served as a visiting fellow at the Japan Institute for International Affairs in Tokyo and a China analyst at the Center for Naval Analyses in Virginia. Uh, he's testified before the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission um, and given talks at the U.S. Naval War College, Japan's National Defense Academy, and Taiwan's National Defense University. Um, he holds an MA in China Studies from National Chengchi University in Taiwan and a BA in International Studies from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, he studied Chinese at Fudan University in Shanghai and National Taiwan Normal University in Taipei. Uh, and his latest book, and the book we're going to discuss today, is uh, The Final Struggle uh, Inside China's Global Strategy. Um, which I think beyond his own work um, on some of the military questions and question of Taiwan, this is a much more holistic um, and uh, and I think historical approach uh, to uh, what the Chinese Communist Party's uh, strategy is uh, uh, for the international domain. So uh, Ian, uh, thanks for joining us. Really excited to have you here. Dave, thanks so much for having me here. Uh, to everybody, a very good afternoon to you all or a very good morning, depending on where in the country you are. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. I'm a huge, huge fan of Gabe and the entire uh, work of the Alexander Hamilton Society. Uh, we've been collaborating together for almost two years now, and it's just a great honor and a privilege uh, to be here. Uh, so as Gabe said, I'm a senior director at the Project 2049 Institute. We're a small think tank in Arlington, Virginia, uh, not far from the Pentagon, focused uh, solely on security issues in Asia. And one of the things that makes us a little different than other think tanks is we're almost all Mandarin linguists. Uh, have spent time living, working, studying in China, and uh, more often than not, uh, Taiwan. And these days, almost always Taiwan, and fewer opportunities to go to China. But that's kind of what we focus on. Focus a lot on uh, allies and partners, and the future of U.S.-Taiwan relations, the future of cross trade relations. So, and actually, you, you mentioned Taiwan. It's not the um, it's not the uh, core subject of your book, but it's actually where I want to start our conversation on, given what's in the news. Um, and uh, just a reminder uh, to folks: is as usual, we'll leave time at the end uh, for you all to ask questions. Um, and to do that, if you look at the Q and A function um, at the bottom of your screen, uh, just uh, submit your question through there in the dashboard. Uh, and then when I turn to that, I'll actually call on you and figuratively hand you the mic, so which means unmute you uh, to actually ask the question itself. And so, Ian, let me maybe just maybe start on Taiwan because it's in the news, um, and that is that uh, 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 our Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. Um, has had a long planned uh, uh, visit uh, to Taiwan scheduled uh, for in a couple of weeks, originally scheduled for a few months ago, but but uh, was postponed. Um, it's become, at least in Washington, a bit of a controversial visit, let's say, or a debate about the visit. Uh, the president himself made comments last week about, you know, maybe she shouldn't go because there might be a military concern out of it. Uh, there have been a, a whole spate of op-eds um, on different sides, kind of different ways, including a big one today in the New York Times, actually, about how it might be dangerous for her to go. Um, can you maybe just kind of unpack the issue for us uh, in terms of uh, not only should she continue with the visit or not, but what are the concerns uh, that might come out of it? And what is the history a little bit of uh, visits by um, uh, members of Congress, and in particular her. I mean, she's she's uh, second in line in, in the uh, presidential succession. It's a little bit different maybe for the speaker, but um, sort of what the context is of what that means and how the Chinese read it. Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of context, Taiwan is a country that is not treated by 
like a country by the United States and by most countries in the world. I think Taiwan has about 15 diplomatic allies left, and that number continues to go down over time. So uh, Taiwan is a free, independent, sovereign country, has been since 1949, and especially since the 1990s when the people of Taiwan, when Taiwan transitioned from an authoritarian dictatorship to a flourishing democracy. So today, Taiwan is, is among the top 10 democracies in the world. It's an incredible uh, success story, not only politically, but also economically and technologically. Taiwan has one of the fastest growing economies in the world. It's at the very, very cutting edge of technology. Uh, when you look at the technology ecosystem, especially for uh, chip technology, semiconductor technology, uh, we all rely on it. So the reason we're able to have a virtual discussion like this today the reason we all have uh, smartphones and smart devices uh, is because of those extremely advanced uh, chips that the Taiwanese produce, especially Taiwan uh, Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation in Shinju, which is the, the Silicon Valley of Taiwan. Uh, why the, the worry and the tension and the hand-wringing and the stress over Speaker Pelosi's announced uh, potential trip to Taiwan? Um, I guess by way of background, Taiwan is diplomatically isolated, and that didn't happen by accident. The Chinese Communist Party is engaged in a multi-decade campaign to isolate, uh, to encircle, and to cut off Taiwan, to try to demoralize Taiwan's government, and to try to control American policymakers in Washington to convince us to abandon Taiwan altogether um, and to weaken Taiwan so that it would be an easier target annexation. Um, and so that's what Beijing has been doing for a very long time. And that campaign has intensified in recent years. There's been a remarkable uptick in provocations from China towards Taiwan. And that's not just military, although the military is what we focus on the most. You know, you see bombers, nuclear capable bombers, um, breaching Taiwan's air defense identification zone. Uh, that's that's pretty remarkable behavior, but it's also going on on the, the, the surface of the sea. Chinese naval exercises, uh, massive uptick in cyber attacks, uh, espionage cases, uh, and again diplomatic diplomatic isolation. So campaign to take those few remaining relationships that Taiwan has and to d disrupt them, uh, and if whenever possible to get countries to, to switch to diplomatic relations. And so that's the context. Um, and unfortunately, the U.S. government has kind of played into Beijing's hands in the sense that we've convinced ourselves, I think, as a country, that anything we might do to show support to Taiwan could be provocative and could be a trigger for a potential crisis and potentially a war. And so this is why we've not seen senior level visits to Taiwan uh, since President Biden came into office. Um, and I think that the speaker has come to the conclusion that, okay, if, if the executive branch can't do this, well, I can do this. I represent the American people. The American people support democracy. We want to show solidarity with the people of Taiwan, especially given the incredible, again, this campaign of coercion that they face every single day. And it's worsening over time. And so my personal opinion is absolutely she should visit. Um, I'm confused as to why the administration thinks that that visit might trigger a conflict. I don't think that's the case at all. Um, and I think the reason we're seeing so many op-eds and so much discussion is because the, the, the administration of the White House does believe, for, for whatever reason, and they may have good intelligence that, that's just not available and they've not made it available yet, um, they might have good intelligence that there is something going on but to my knowledge, there's not something going on that they're trying to prevent the speaker from going. They're trying to talk her out of it. She still wants to go. I think she will go. I think there's very little question at this point that she will go. Um, and so it's just a matter of time that she will. I don't believe this is going to trigger a crisis unless a crisis was coming anyway. So it may be the case that Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party elite is looking to escalate. They might be looking for um, a crisis. And if they are, then, then no matter what we do, that crisis is coming. 
But if we assume that they're not actually looking for a crisis, then I think she's going to go. And I think um, there'll be some huffing and puffing, but I don't think um, there'll be any major confrontation or, or any real danger beyond what we're already seeing today. How central, and then and then we can uh, uh, pivot a little bit to sort of how you start the book, but um, how central are these, uh, if you will, kind of campaigns of um, intimidation uh, or pressure uh, on uh, American officials or American businesses and, and citizens writ large to try and keep Taiwan diplomatically isolated, as you put it, to Chinese strategy? Um, is this a major part of, of how the how Beijing approaches things, which is basically just you know, threaten consequences, but in the end, uh, you know, is, have they ever followed through on them? You know, have there ever been concerns in the past that, that they've actually made good on some of these threats? Or is this more of a, you know, game of chicken or staring contest, however, whatever analogy you want to use, um, and whoever kind of hold, 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 you know, holds holds the, the, the kind of long-term patience ends up winning? You know, luckily, it, it's better than a game of chicken, right? Because in a game of chicken, very often in time, somebody does crash and burn. Uh, and sometimes they both crash and burn into each other. Um, in, in this case, this is part and parcel for the way the Chinese Communist Party does diplomacy. This is um, how they do strategy. This is how they do what they refer to as political warfare. We sometimes refer to it as um, malign influence operations. Um, this happened a lot in the past. So I can give you multiple examples. Uh, in the late 1990s, early 2000s, the U.S. was discussing the sale of Patriot-3 ballistic missile defense batteries to Taiwan. Chinese officials swore up and down that that would be the trigger for an all-out invasion of Taiwan. They, they told American officials at the Pentagon and the State Department, if you sell Patriot-3 to Taiwan, then there's going to be a war and it's going to be your fault. The U.S. went ahead and did sell Patriot 3 ballistic missile defense batteries to Taiwan, and there was no war. And in fact, there's no crisis. Uh, it happened again recently during the Trump administration. There was a very large campaign of coercion here in Washington, where you had China's then ambassador to the United States going around to think tanks and to consultancies and anybody who would meet with him. Uh, and he met with, with one of my bosses at the time, and, and he said, if you sell F-16s, because at the time that was the big debate, should the U.S. sell uh, 66 new F-16s to Taiwan, three squadrons more, because Taiwan has an aging air force and they desperately need new fighter aircraft. Um, and the Chinese said, if you sell those F-16s to Taiwan, then a million people are going to die. You do realize it, don't you? That's that's what, that was actually his talking point, um, and at least. Those that I know were saying, no, that's not going to happen. You guys are not insane. We don't believe you're insane. Uh, and we think you're bluffing. And so the Trump administration did announce the sale of those 66 new F-16s to Taiwan. And sure enough, after some demarches, and demarche is just uh, a diplomatic term for complaining, right? complaining to the other side, registering your, your displeasure with their behavior, uh, it blew over and there were no that there was no crisis and there were no Chinese attacks. So this is this is actually happens all the time. Fortunately, though, it often works. So a lot of American leaders do get scared when they have Chinese government officials threatening them, when they threaten war. It's something we take very seriously. Um, not, I think not enough officials realize that this is just part and parcel of the way the CCP does business, the way they've always done business, the way they always will do business. And more often than not, these are these are empty threats. So let's talk about that. And, and this is really the crux of your book. I was it, it, this line appears a few times throughout the book, but it's also the very beginning and forms the crux that really struck me is that you 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 say straight out the CCP has a strategy for world domination. You know that's a pretty uh, 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 blunt uh, and I think shocking statement to a lot of folks, even folks that I think are very concerned. Uh, about the direction that uh, China has gone, given Xi Jinping and CCP decisions over the last uh, couple decades. So my first question to you is, what do you actually mean by that when you say they have a strategy for world domination? Um, because I think there's some debate about uh, whether they have uh, regional ambitions uh, versus global ambitions, uh, some debate about whether this is the natural the uh, uh, pace or course of a rising power 
um, as opposed to one that is, you know, ideologically oriented to 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 to, to seek out uh, uh, seas and lands way beyond its end. So you have a very specific, I think, definition just from your work, but maybe you can just kind of like start with that, which is what do you mean when you say they actually have a strategy for global domination? I think um, I mean the same thing as U.S. government officials when they talk about China's ambitions to create a new world order. So Secretary of State Blinken recently gave a big China speech, and he came out and said that th this is China's long-term strategic intention. They intend to create a new, new world order. Uh, the Director of National Intelligence, uh, Radcliffe, said that during the Trump administration as well. He penned an op-ed which he said the same thing, that China plans to dominate the U.S. and other countries around the world, economically, militarily, technologically. This book tells that story. So uh, I, I don't, um, well, I didn't realize what a shocking statement that was. I, I guess Gabe, hearing it from you makes me realize, yeah, actually, it's a, it is it's, quite a, it's a big bold out there. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying I necessarily disagree. I'm just saying it's a great way to start a book, and it's the thesis of the book, really. It really is, yeah. And so, I guess the book is just trying to explain what what others have already said, perhaps in more sophisticated ways or more indirect ways. Uh, I guess you're right. I just do come out and, write, and say that right away is that this is what it actually means when we talk about creating a new world order. Uh, that's what we're talking about here. Uh, this was an idea that I actually debated against three, four years ago. I was at a, a week-long workshop uh, with a lot of uh, Pentagon officials and, and other leading American strategists, including many, many of your friends, uh, Gabe, and many of those that are involved in the Alexander Hamilton Society. And I actually argued against it. I had just finished writing my first book, The Chinese Invasion Threat. And I said, listen, guys, you, you keep talking about China's global strategy. I don't think so. I think they're focused like a laser beam on preparing for a future annexation or invasion of Taiwan. And that this is the key flashpoint, that this is going to decide more peace in our time. But I listened to their the other presentations and then I started to do more research. Gabe, I started uh, reading more and more of your work and work of, of people like Aaron Freeberg and Nadej Roland uh, and many others. And then I started to read Xi Jinping speeches and textbooks about what is Xi Jinping thought? What is his definition of great power relations with Chinese patriots or, or great power diplomacy? And then uh, I started to read a lot of planning documents and uh, you know, long range planning documents because the, the CCP has 10 year plans, they have five year plans, they have two year action plans. Um, and these are in the different party uh, apparatuses. So like the propaganda department has theirs, the central organization department has theirs, right? The central party school has theirs. Uh, and then the ministries have theirs. So the Ministry of Science and Technology, for example, their various plans. And I started to read those and it was kind of like putting together this big jigsaw puzzle. You have all these pieces, but you don't have the cover of the box. So you don't know what you, what is supposed to look like in the end when you, you know, you don't know what that mosaic is supposed to look like when you piece everything together. But I tried it and as time went on, it took me about three years to write this book. And as time went on, it, it started to crystallize that, holy smokes, I had been wrong. That Taiwan is, is incredibly important, it's critical, but Taiwan's not the end point for for China's strategy. They actually do have a global strategy and they actually do intend to dominate uh, not just their region, but the entire surface of the earth, all, all humanity. And Xi Jinping has actually been talking a lot about this. He even talked about it in his big, uh, people call it the, the Castro speech, that three and a half hour long speech he gave at the 19th party Congress five years ago in, in 2017. Uh, I'm sure he's gonna talk about it again this fall at the 20th party Congress because he talks about it at every speech he gives. And what it is, is a concept he refers to as a community and common, a community and common destiny for all mankind. Uh, or sometimes this is referred to as a shared future for all mankind, the construction of a fair, shared future for all mankind. Um, that's a pleasant sounding jargon. Uh, I wasn't sure what it meant. And so I dug into it. What he's actually talking about is creating a world where all governments would be 
uh, network together in a centralized fashion, they would all cease to become democracies. They would emulate China's one party dictatorship. They would all be under the control of the leadership. That's what he's describing. And they're actually not just writing about it and talking about it, but they're actually working to put it in, into action in a number of different ways. So, well, so maybe you can talk about some of those in practice because um, so you, in the book, you talk about how the party has this vision. The party is 100 years old now. Um, at other times, some people will talk about uh, about the PRC, about the People's Republic has these goals or had these ambitions. Again, uh, the PRC is, uh, to get my math right, about 75 years old or so. Um, and then to the, to the example you just gave is Xi Jinping himself, um, who has now been you know general secretary of the party for uh, a decade and may well, as you alluded to, um, uh, this coming fall, uh, be uh, uh, I'm trying to think of what the right word is reelected, reselected, reappointed uh, for maybe a, another another term here. Are those three things the same thing when it comes to this strategy? Is it the, the party, Xi Jinping's own uh, stamp on it, uh, and and the regime itself? Are there differences between them? Has she taken this in a in a new uh, or different or accelerated direction compared to you know some of his predecessors? I think they all are the same thing in terms of the ultimate objective, the ultimate uh, end vision. And it actually didn't start in China. It started in, in Moscow. It started with Lenin. Uh, so in 1919, Lenin formed like an organization to bring together all the communist uh, organizations or all the, the ultra left-wing radical militant organizations in the world together. Uh, and it was called Comintern. Communist International was this body. And it was directly under uh, Lenin's a personal dictatorship. Stalin then ended up inheriting this uh, after Lenin died. And it was an organization that was internationally minded. The idea was to spread uh, first socialism, you know, and not the liberal democratic socialism that's practiced in very successfully in Northern Europe, for example, or even in countries like Japan or Taiwan where they have socialized medicine. That's not what this is about at all. This is about party dictatorship. This is about what George Orwell wrote about in, in his famous novel, 1984, that he described. Um, that's what the Soviet Union was. And that's what they spread to many other countries, North Korea, China, um, and, and Cuba, and, and of course, all across Eastern Europe. And that's what they attempted to spread around the world. The U.S., of course, stopped that. And we had a, a policy of containment to actually stop the, the spread of, of one point dictatorship. Um, that was inherited by Mao, and uh, that vision continues to animate the Chinese Communist Party to this day. The difference, of course, though, is one of style. So if that's your ultimate ambition to have world socialism, which is a network of one party dictatorships around the world uh, that are made in your model um, that you ultimately control, um, and then you tell people it's going to be communism. It's going to be international communism. What is that? That is when you you go through the, the, the socialist phase and it's supposed to be humanity's development, the development of a, of, a, of a very internationally minded, integrated, collectivized human civilization. And then over time, you no longer need governments. You no longer need that dictatorship that borders dissolve away and that somehow you have this heaven on earth, uh, this communist utopia. So that's what Xi Jinping has promised. That's what the Chinese Communist Party has always promised from the very beginning. And of course they got it from the Soviet Union. Uh, the difference is in style. So how do you get there? How urgent are you? Uh, what tools do you use? How do you talk about it? How do you get others to go along with, with the plan? And that's where Xi Jinping is different than his predecessors. Uh, because he's much more, frankly, he's, he's more candid. He's more transparent about it. Uh, he's more openly ambitious. He wants to do it in his own lifetime. That was, I don't think, something that Hu Jintao talked about doing or Zhang Zemin or Zhang Xiaoping. They, they, they had that ultimate objective. Um, but I don't think it was until Xi Jinping uh, where it became clear he wanted to do this in his lifetime. And he and, he, and he, apparently he believes it's actually possible. I mean, so well, I, the, what changes have you seen 
you know, you, you talked about these, you know, dreams, if you will, or ambitions are one thing, but actually putting it into practice is another, and the way in which they do it matter. Um, how would you say that uh, she, at least during his uh, uh, tenure and, and you know, maybe uh, into perpetuity, into the end of his lifetime, we'll see what happens. Um, what is What changes has he actually made in order to affect this in a more near term? How has he brought this goal or attempted to bring this goal of his uh, closer uh, or, or further up in time uh, rather than those of his predecessors? I think he's accelerated a lot of the things that, that had already started um, prior to him coming to power. Uh, so when it had already started was the co-option of the United Nations and all of the United Nations affiliates. We already had Chinese government officials and Chinese Communist Party members um, taking leadership roles at the United Nations, for example. Um, that had already begun, that's accelerated under Xi Jinping. We already had Chinese government officials gaining access to uh, policymakers around the world through lobbying efforts. So if you co-opt corporations, if you make uh, major corporations dependent on, on the China market, on uh, Chinese supply chains, for example, then you can actually hold them hostage. And we've seen that happen to a lot of our companies, including uh, companies such as Apple, which is the largest uh, corporation that's ever existed. Um, it was, this year it was reported that it was worth $3 trillion. Just one company alone is worth $3 trillion, which is uh, much more than the most advanced, uh, advanced countries around the world in terms of their annual GDP. It's really remarkable. But Apple has, has been coerced into a position where they actually have to invest in uh, R&D, strategic R&D projects that the CCP has identified in China. They have to invest a lot. Uh, and this has happened to a lot of our leading technology companies. Um, and then, of course, we've seen this very uh, remarkable military buildup under Xi Jinping because this is a militarized uh, effort in addition to trying to take over economically and dominate the economic space and to make everybody dependent on you for their, for their for market access and for supply chain security. Um, there's also a very large military component to it. Um, and so we've seen what Xi Jinping refers to as military civil fusion strategy, this military civil fusion strategy. And that is uh, co-equal to the one belt, one road strategy or, or often referred to as the, the belt road initiative which is a global uh, effort to try to tie together governments around the world and make them dependent on Beijing for their critical infrastructure, for their data, um, and ultimately to have them coordinate their policies with Beijing. Uh, but there's also that military component to it. Since 2015, and especially in 2016, Xi Jinping orchestrated a wholesale sweeping uh, re-engineering of the Chinese military from top to bottom and, and bottom to top. And it is absolutely remarkable how people can see it. I mean, we're now looking at what has been referred to as the largest peacetime military buildup the world has seen in over 100 years. No other country in peacetime has built up as rapidly as China is today and as, as China has been, frankly, for the last 20 years. So these are some of the components to it and and obviously there's there's a debate in washington over you know which which of these elements of their strategy is most concerning to us uh i'll put the military aside for a second the economic one um, which you touched on is one that seems very concerning to us just this past week the senate passed um in a relatively large bipartisan bipartisan majority the chips act uh, which is dealing with only one section of that we'll see if it passes the house a bit of a debate on that in the book you mentioned repeatedly about how Chinese companies themselves are not really private uh, in the way that you know we as Americans would understand it, um, that every company has uh, party members on its board, that uh, foreign companies are required to form um, joint ventures with CCP controlled companies to operate in the country. The distinction between public and private uh, uh, becomes very gray uh, very quickly. Um, can you can you kind of explain what that means? And I know that through the book you have a kind of replete with examples uh, of how that goes. But can you explain what that means to kind of our you know for our, our audience? And and also, is that in and of itself a concern for the United States? The fact that you know the way in which they 
in, you know, infuse or infiltrate their companies is just totally anathema to how we think about things? Or is it uh, what those companies they're, they're upon might do um, if so called upon uh, by the government? Yeah, I mean, I think this is why it's so important that we all kind of get smart on ideology. I, I've certainly had to do that. You know, when I went to school, I, I never took the idea of, of socialism or communism seriously at all. I mean, I, I grew up in the 90s, right, where the Cold War was over and liberal free market democracy had won and, you know, history had ended. We, we would never face another ideological challenge. Um, I had to go back to school on, on the way these regimes think because I was coming across so many terms in the research that I didn't recognize. Um, but they're very, very important for understanding how China's government actually thinks, how the Chinese government thinks. And one of the things that's clear is they do not believe in individual sovereignty. They don't believe that individuals matter as an end to themselves. The individual man or woman uh, can be easily sacrificed. They're an instrument for the use of the state. And that's also applied for corporations. So the reason we have private sovereign companies that are protected by rule of law in the US and in Western Europe and, and in all advanced economies around the world is because we believe in that idea of individual sovereignty. And we apply that to corporate identities. So a corporation is not uh, actually treated as an arm of the state. Uh, there are of course still state-owned enterprises that are. You know, places like Amtrak, for example, is is an arm of the US government, um, but that's not a private company and everybody knows it's not a private company. Um, Apple is a private company, just by way of example, or Facebook or Google uh, or Ford, I mean, Intel, pick, pick your company. Um, so they're protected by rule of law. They're treated as sovereign uh, individual entities. They cannot be forced to do what the White House tells them. Except in wartime, in wartime, uh, there's there's a bit of a bit of an exception to that rule, but in peacetime they certainly cannot be forced to do anything that they don't want to do, and they're legally protected under under law. That is not the case at all in China. That uh, there's no such thing as rule of law in the People's Republic of China. There's rule by law, and the Chinese Communist Party sits above the law and it decides. What, what the rules are and when and where they want to apply them. All companies in China exist to serve the Chinese Communist Party, according to the Chinese Communist Party and according to, to PRC law. And that means, of course, that they also must serve the armed wing of the Chinese Communist Party. That's the People's Liberation Army, the PLN, Chinese military. And they also have to serve the intelligence organizations, intelligence agencies of the Chinese Communist Party. So the Ministry of State Security, for example, uh, two PLA, which is the intelligence branch of, of the Chinese military, three PLA, now the Strategic Support Force, um, and they have to support United Front Work Department, which is another form of intelligence. It's kind of we don't have here uh, in, in the democracy. It's very powerful, uh, very problematic. They have to serve the Public Security Bureau. And so by law, if you read uh, PRC laws, and I was stunned to actually go and, and read some of these laws, a number of them, a number of new ones came out in 2017, you read them, and they say that all Chinese companies have to support state intelligence operations, and they have to have back doors in all the technology. They have to make sure that we have, we the Chinese companies, have access to all their data. And in wartime, every organization has to support the PLA and has to be ready to support the PLA. Uh, under the National Mobilization uh, Act and the National Transportation Act. Uh, and so this is how they do business. And it matters a great deal for us here in the United States because we, we are so intertwined with the PRC economically. And we have uh, research labs of Chinese companies in the United States. So for example, Alibaba and Baidu and Tencent and Hytera. Uh, and of course, the list goes on and on of major Chinese technology companies that are controlled by the Chinese Communist Party and by law have to support uh, Chinese intelligence operations and the PLA in war. That they have research labs in the United States 
and they hire Americans to work at those labs, including some of our, our best and brightest. And there's nothing illegal about that today, you know, by, as the, the law currently stands. Uh, and our major port facilities, for example, we have a Chinese state-owned enterprise, which is part of China's military industrial complex, ZPMC, actually dominates all of our container ports. Now you can uh, look, I, for the book, I have a map uh, that I had commissioned and you look at the top 14 container ports in the United States. I've actually done further research since the book came out to look at number 15 and number 16. Sure enough, ZPMC is, is also dominating those, those port facilities. So all of the gantry cranes, the automated smart cranes that load and offload ships at all of our container ports, those are made in Shanghai or in the Shanghai suburbs by an arm of China's military industrial complex. The employees of that company uh, dominate all of our container ports. They have agreements with the longshoremen associations at all of our major container ports. And they are directly employed by the, by the Chinese government. Uh, and not only is there a risk of obvious backdoors into all of that, uh, which can be very, very problematic, but they're also installing their own supplies and chips because they, they want contracts that allow them to service other companies' gantry cranes as well. As well. So these are some of the, and, and of course, this goes on in our prisons, uh, in our train systems, um, in our telecommunications grid. Uh, we recently saw just two days ago, the FBI has come out and said, uh, Huawei, for example, has been eavesdropping on the highly sensitive communication systems that we use to uh, the US military to communicate with the um, nuclear uh, nuclear weapons uh, silos out in, in the Midwest and how problematic that, that could potentially be in, in war time for us. Um, and so these are some of the reasons it matters. It also matters a great deal because what it means is at the end of the day, we're investing our own money into the success of our adversaries. So when policymakers talk about strategic competition, I don't think it's a complete thought until we can figure out how we come to a place where we're not actually investing in the success of the community. But so how does this work? And, and, and for, for those of you, please, I see some questions starting to be submitted. Continue to submit. We'll, we'll go to them in just a couple of minutes. How does this actually work in practice? Is it that the, the you know, because at the same time, I, I, I see the party as, again, it's it's a it's a big bureaucratic institution at the same time. Those tend to not move very swiftly, um, and coordinated action can be difficult. Um, you know, we've we've seen some of these problems. Uh, you, you mentioned the Soviets as an example. So, um, is it that you know the party is somehow mapping, identifying? Uh, you know, we want to be able to, you know, theoretically control these ports in the United States or these container uh, uh, delivery systems or whatever it is, and as a consequence, we are going to direct. You know, this company, ostensibly a private company, but not really to, you know, compete for this contract and win this contract and then be able to install uh, whether the technology or the people necessary and glean the data. I mean, is it from the beginning uh, or is it um, uh, to your point, I think you mentioned briefly, which is uh, we want to just it's not the concern isn't now, although you can't separate them about what's going on now. The concern is there would if there comes a day where a decision is made by the party and a switch gets flipped. Um, you talked, to, I think you talk about in the book, this example that the um, uh, uh, that the, the Philippines power grid uh, is basically run by the Chinese. Um, it, I mean, is the concern now or the concern is, you know, one day they may have a problem. They're going to say, well, we're just going to threaten to, you know, turn off the power grid or jack up the price or whatever it is and, and, and use it as leverage. That, that's where I'm, I'm kind of trying to understand. The concern is how they may use it at a time of their choosing where the concern is right now in terms of, of, of the data they're collecting or the um, the information that they're acquiring? The concern is not in the present and it's not in the future. It's both. Uh, it's the concern in the, in the present is that they're able to use this kind of leverage to control what, what our leaders do. And so you see that with uh, CEOs of companies, for example, when Chinese government wants something, they'll actually lean on those CEOs who are held hostage by all of their ties to China. And then those CEOs will go to the White House and they'll say, Mr. President, 
uh, we really think that you know this trade war or this this economic policy or this whatever it may be we we don't think that's a good idea that's going to hurt the american people that's going to hurt our economy that's going to hurt our bottom line you better not do it um that's very powerful having that ability to have so many leading individuals held hostage is powerful and that affects our policy that affects our ability to have a policy that actually protects our national security. The concern in the future, of course, is uh, what will that lead to? What, what if this continues and our dependence on China actually deepens over time and our vulnerabilities continue to deepen because they're not, this is not something that is um, static at all. It, this has deepened in a remarkable fashion over the last 10 years as China's economy has grown as its sophistication has grown, as its influence has grown. It's really remarkable. We've come to the place that we are today. And so I have uh, two chapters in the book where I talk about, okay, what are the implications for that if there's not ever a conflict with that? What does that look like? And how will that affect the future of American democracy? I argue that it will destroy American democracy um, if China dominates China can actually achieve its strategic ends, the U.S. will cease to become a liberal democracy. Um, and I, I know that sounds uh, sort of alarmist, and I felt very alarmist as I was writing it, but if you read through each chapter, um, it really becomes clear uh, that I think that is true, and, and you can see the evidence that I cite and why I believe that. And then, you can, of course, you can decide for yourself if I'm right or wrong. Yeah, I'm wrong. Um, and then there's another chapter, another section where I talk about, hey, what are the implications for wartime? What does it look like on the homeland here in America if there's, for example, a war over Taiwan, and the United States is uh, getting ready to defend Taiwan, or we are defending Taiwan? Look at all the ways that we're compromised, even on our own home. And all the things that that the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese military can do to us, based on the access that they now have, because they've again they, they've gotten access to so many of our networks, and our critical infrastructure, and they're able to influence the way we ultimately the way we think. Because if you can control what people do and don't say, and if you can get people to self censor, which they're very good at, and if you can get American companies. Uh, like Marietta International uh, recently fired an employee in Omaha, Nebraska, because he liked a tweet, like one of the Dahlma's <laughs> tweets. Uh, and so they ended up firing him um, because they came under so much pressure from China's government. The MBA has, has fired two employees now, uh, one on the administrative side and, and an actual player, uh, really, really good athlete, both because they were criticizing China, governments, uh, the Chinese government's actions, and they're supporting human rights. And so we've now come to a place where Americans are losing their jobs if they don't tell Beijing why. That, if you continue that into the future, that's very, very dangerous. We've also come to a place where a lot of Americans depend on China for their survival, and they don't even realize it. Uh, we depend on China for a lot of our pharmaceuticals. For example, life-saving drugs. Uh, we depend on them for our personal protection equipment. So everything from masks to gloves, to surgical gowns, ID bags, um, to the computer systems used in, in all of our hospitals, our pharmacies. Uh, they all rely on Chinese hardware and software. And so what happens in the event of a conflict all of a sudden we're cut off. Because today there is no American company on American soil that's making antibiotics, for example. Uh, that's all been offshore to China. And that didn't happen by accident. That, that's part of this strategy. So Gabe, you asked how it actually happens. Uh, I can't tell you that uh, in concrete terms, I don't know. Uh, I can tell you though that there are very um, careful planning documents that are and at the highest levels of China's government. And I've read many of them, and they're public documents in, in many cases, where they'll say, here are our objectives. Now, you guys below, you know, state, 
uh, well, not state, provincial governments and municipal governments and party cells and corporations and in the military, you guys actually make this happen. Here's what we want, now go make it happen. And they have this remarkable ability to do that in a top-down fashion, to issue these directives that everybody follows all the way down. And you can you can see it. So uh, you can read a national level plan, planning up. Then you can read the provincial level version of that. Where the province gets more granular. Here's how we're going to do it in our province. And then you can read a Chinese state-owned enterprise or a Chinese uh, corporation like Huawei or ZT. You can read their version of the plan, and, and they'll say, okay, here's the directive. Here's how we in our work unit is going to actually see it through. And then all the way down to the, the individual, not, not the individual level, but the individual work unit level, where they'll talk about, here's how we're going to see it put into practice. And because there are so many tools of surveillance and ultimately of control, the Chinese Communist Party has created to monitor the performance of Chinese Communist Party members, um, including those in Chinese corporations and companies and labs and universities and media and, and you name it, um, they're able to somehow make it all work. And they're able to avoid a lot of the bureaucratic inertia that we saw in the former Soviet Union and that we see in many other communist countries around the world. My working hypothesis is that one of the reasons they've been so successful at getting around inertia is not because they're so well organized, although maybe that's part of it, is because they have so much foreign help. And so right now, whenever they come into, uh, whenever they have a problem organizationally, or if it's an R&D problem, and they can't solve it, they can't get around it, they can buy the brain power of Americans who will solve it for them. Because a lot of American consultancies are only too happy, happy to work for the Chinese government. Um, and a lot of American professors uh, and even some of our national labs are only too happy to do basic research in collaboration with Chinese counterparts. And, and so I think that's when they, they can kind of feed off the vitality of free and open societies like ours, and not just ours, of course, also countries like Canada and Taiwan and Japan and, and France and England, you know, name your, uh, South Korea, name your tech hub um, or your financial hub, and they can reach out and they can they can actually buy, buy that talent. And that's what they do. All right, let's go to a few questions. Uh, and for those of you who, who haven't submitted your question yet, at the bottom uh, of your screen, there's a Q and A function. Uh, just submit it there, and then I'll actually call on you. So, uh, Axel de Vernu, uh, I, I, the microphone is yours. If you could just introduce yourself and then ask your question. Thank you so much for your talk, Mr. Easton. Uh, my name is Axel. I'm a rising sophomore at Yale and turning at the Hudson Institute. Uh, so my question is about the role of nuclear weapons in China's military doctrine. I'm wondering if you think that the unprecedented buildup that we're seeing now is for aggressive purposes in Taiwan, perhaps, or if China really is trying to do a minimum deterrent strategy like Russia and the US have for their own doctrines? And uh, if so, how do you think that these weapons change our calculus in Taiwan? Should we be sending nuclear weapons to the island? Any thoughts on nuclear weapons would be appreciated. Thanks so much. Axel, that, that's a great question. I love how you go right to the heart of the matter. Uh, nuclear weapons are very difficult to, to talk about. They're even hard for us to think about, uh, which is why I think uh, we've gotten to a, a point where we're so stunned that China has engaged in such a remarkable nuclear buildup because for decades we've convinced ourselves that that would never happen. You know, nuclear weapons seem so 20th century, and here we are in the, the 21st century, uh, now in a, you know, the early days of what is likely to be a very, very intense nuclear arms race uh, against China. And it's more complicated because we're also racing against Russia. Um, I don't think they're seeking to achieve a minimum deterrent. I don't think they're, um, I don't think they have minimalistic foreign policy goals. I think they have uh, maximalist goals. Um, and I, you know, if you read the book, you, you, can, um, you can read for yourself a lot of the top level speeches and writings about just how ambitious their goals are. 
things that Xi Jinping himself has said. So they're seeking dominance. And part of that is nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons, it's the ultimate uh, trump card. It's the ultimate ace in the hole. If you have more nukes than the other side, it might not matter tactically or operationally because you don't actually need to use them all to destroy the world. But psychologically, it matters a great deal. And so I think that's that's their objective is to have a psychological advantage. Because again, my my view is that they're seeking dominance, not just regional, but global. And a big part of that is psychological. And that's where nuclear weapons play a very, very powerful role. And so in terms of Taiwan, um, unfortunately, we've already seen this year the role that nuclear blackmail can play in international relations. Putin has used Russia's nuclear weapons capability to blackmail the United States and NATO countries to keep us from doing more to support uh, Ukraine's democracy and, and freedom and its defense of its of its sovereignty. And of course, that's what the Chinese Communist Party wants to be able to do in the future as well. Put the United States in a position where we will blink in the in the event of nuclear overage. So let me, uh, there's another question, that, but uh, the, the questioner, I think, is having some audio difficulty and seems to have logged off briefly, so I'll just kind of read it to you. Um, so uh, he asks, uh, there seems to be much speculation in and outside China of Xi's real intentions with his notion of, quote, the final struggle. Is the main objective to secure or strengthen Xi's absolute power? Is it to export the Chinese model internationally? Is it to restructure Chinese society and deal with domestic, quote, disharmony? Is it all of the above? Uh, and most importantly, is it possible that Xi's intentions is only one of those and may actually come into conflict uh, with some of the others? I would say this is not just about Xi Jinping. This is about the Chinese Communist Party. I mean, the final struggle was not something that Xi Jinping invented, um, that this was invented long, long ago. And he's continuing the, the campaign and he's taken it to the next level. He's really turned it up to a 10, maybe he's turned it up to an 11. Um, and he's got, now gotten to the point where you can look at the cult of personality that he's built around himself, which we've seen many times in the past. This happened with Lenin, this happened with Stalin, this happened with Castro, this happened with uh, Kim Jong-il. Um, and of course, this, this happened with Mao. Uh, Xi Jinping is, is indulging in this cult of personality. And so part of it is about him, right? It's part of it is maybe he does actually have a God complex. He does suffer maybe from megalomania. I think it would be very difficult for any, any man or woman on the planet, no matter how good hearted you may be, if you get that much absolute power at your disposal, and if everybody around you is constantly treating you like a God, then that, that actually will corrupt you, will corrupt anybody. That's why it's so dangerous to have one party dictate over this. Um, and so I would argue that he's very corrupt, very, very corrupt, and not just in the um, penal way, but also in terms of power, in terms of what that does to his psychology. And I think that comes out with some of the speeches that he's given, some of the things that he says he wants to achieve, because he does want to achieve a wholesale re engineering of Chinese society and to export that around and to make sure that he is a dictator for life. And not just that, but a dictator whose legacy will live forever. So he's actually placed himself on par um, as the one true heir to Karl Marx, which is stunning. He's actually said, I'm more important than Mao. I'm more important than Stalin. I'm more important than maybe even uh, you know, Lenin. I'm the one who's going to realize Marx's ultimate goal of world socialism and international dominance. That, to me, suggests he's really um, in a very dangerous place psychologically. Is that, so just to follow up on that, um, could that be the seeds of the pro of his own demise uh, in, a, in and of itself right there, that the, the, the megalomania, uh, the cult of personality, 
uh, the venal corrupt nature, the kind of uh, the historical um, uh, uniqueness that he kind of bestows upon himself, could that actually end up uh, felling um, uh, the kind of longer uh, uh, or longer standing party intentions on some of these things? No doubt. No doubt about, no doubt about it. Uh, it's very, very dangerous for him individually. It's very, very dangerous for the Chinese Communist Party. And it's very dangerous for all the people of China. When you have a leader that suffers from the God complex. He's likely to make terribly um, terribly wrong calculations, miscalculations, make huge strategic mistakes, and a lot of people will suffer for it. He might actually be the last to suffer uh, because so many other people will will have to fall before before he does. Uh, and we've seen this before with guys like Adolf Hitler, right? We saw this with Stalin, some of the things that he did because he suffered from a similar complex. We saw this with Mao because he suffered from a similar complex. So many people had to suffer because of it. Um, and so, you know, the question becomes, what do we do? Um, and I think one of the things that would be rational for us to do is to start decoupling and delinking and, and, and cutting our fetters because we're dealing with a China that may be in the hands of a madman and is certainly in the hands of a radical militant regime. That's what the Chinese Communist Party is. It's driven by radical ideology. So we don't want to be dependent on that country for our prosperity and our economic well-being. Um, and we don't want them to be able to influence our domestic politics. Unfortunately, they're now in a position where they can. And so we need to protect ourselves, first and foremost, protect our own freedom and democracy. And then we need to prepare to deter them from launching a war of aggression. And that's why we need to maintain our superiority at the nuclear level of war fighting and also the conventional level of war fighting. And we need to make it crystal clear that we're prepared to go to do whatever it takes to protect our national interests, protect our country, protect our allies, protect countries like Taiwan. Because if we don't, that could actually tempt tragedy, especially when you're dealing with a regime like this, that it's very hard to communicate resolve regime like now, it's hard to scare them, but it's doable. We did it very well throughout the Cold War. We were able to preserve the peace, um, and I, I think we're perfectly capable of doing it again today. So let me go for the last question to uh, Catherine Clark. Go ahead, Catherine. Hi. So my question is, um, I'll just choose uh, the latter. Um, are you concerned about figures currently working in government or elected officials enabling CCP's global strategy? I know there's been a literature on the subject of how this was done with overall, I think good intentions or uh, naive intentions about what China's strategy ultimately was, but now there seems to be a recognition of these things. So do you think there are now mechanisms to check this or is this still a problem? Well, I think it's, it's still a problem and that there's a growing awareness of, of the problem, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done. I think the Federal Bureau of Investigation is probably overwhelmed at this point. And so they need, uh, they're going to need to make some reforms. Um, I think our um, Congress, there's a lot of laws that probably need to be passed that have yet to be passed. There are a lot of difficult reforms that need to be made uh, that have not yet been made. There's a lot of corporations that are starting to understand uh, the dangerous ground that they're now on, and they're starting to make some reforms, but there are many others that are still asleep. And so I think a big part of it is actually public education, uh, waking up uh, as many Americans as possible um, and informing them, giving the information that they need so that they can make Informed decisions. And I think that's what Alexander Hamilton Society does best. I'm not aware of any other organization that has the kind of reach that you guys do that's helping educate the next generation of American leaders. And so I think that's why, why this is so important because this is not an, a problem that the government by itself can solve for. It. Can't sit back and wait for the federal government to, to save the day. That's not going to happen. Uh, this, I think, will require a whole 
of society now. And so that's why I think public education is, is the place to start. And that's why it's such a, a privilege for me and, and pleasure and an honor to be able to do events like this. So I, I really appreciate it. Well, it's, it's, it's hard to, to, uh, to, to say anything beyond those kind words, uh, that you ended up, which you appreciate it. Um, I hope, uh, I hope everybody goes out and reads the book. Um, and for those students, you might, if we want to invite you into campus to talk a lot more in depth, uh, because we only scratched the surface here. And so everything from, uh, the, the, the primary source uh, material that you've uh, spent a lot of time in, I think, which is really key. A lot of folks might generally be aware uh, of some of the topics that you covered, but, um, the fact that you're sort of looking in their own words and the party's own documents and, and speeches, I think, makes a big difference. And just the the, the litany of, uh, of of examples um, that you kind of work through uh, throughout the book uh, of where in different sectors or or in different um, uh, and there's a lot of it happening right now, actually, too. Um, I think is really eye opening for a lot of folks. So congratulations on the book uh, for everybody. The final struggle inside China's global strategy uh, available at bookstores everywhere. And uh, Ian, thank you so much for joining us. Okay, thanks so much for having me. It's really a pleasure. And, and to everybody who's, who's viewing this, I know this is the middle of the summer. You guys are all very busy and you probably have many, many other uh, options available to you. So thank you guys for taking the time. Really appreciate it. Great. All right. Thanks, Evening. See everybody soon.